To start out, uh, John Maxwell, business author and, and speaker, uh, said that change is inevitable, but growth is optional. And we know that instinctively about change, don't we? We know it's inevitable, particularly in healthcare. We're swimming in a sea of change every single day and trying to keep up with everything that's coming at us. Uh, from the way healthcare is financed to the way it's delivered and managed. We can't escape it. It's a constant for those of us who work here, and for many of us it's a form of uh, kind of job security that that's the case. But change uh, doesn't mean that positive growth is going to incur. Inherent in what Mr. Maxwell was saying, the truth uh, is that growth is not guaranteed with all change. Just because it's new and different doesn't necessarily mean it's good or, or better. Growth is optional and invites us to serve the world around us first and foremost. Growth finds the best answer, even if that means, as we heard uh, yesterday uh, with the Komen folks, collaborating with my competitors, quote unquote, as it were, or even if it's something that I can't personally control or didn't come up with the idea, it seeks the win-win for the consumer and everyone else who's involved. So on a personal level, I'm pleased and grateful to work with a number of you across Michigan who are um, not just trying to survive this change every day, but are truly trying to figure out and seek how we uh, grow uh, together through it. So I'm a little um, impressed for time to get us all in, so I'm gonna go quick uh, through this stuff, uh, but I wanna touch on three points on this kind of change growth theme real quick. Um, amidst all the industry change, how we've we done uh, over the past five years, touch on a couple points there, what issues are on top uh, of the, the stack still as it relates to HIE nationally? And then five years better informed, what are a couple thoughts on where, where we go from my perspective? So how have we done over the last five years? On a practical scale and I think a comparative scale with other states, I think it's pretty clear that Michigan has done well establishing electronic connections to its uh, key state registries. Immunization, reportable labs, and dromic surveillance are well beyond low volume pilots and are accepting production data on a, on a large scale. GLHC uh, itself contributing 39,000 reportable labs, 379,000 immunizations for almost 1,000 offices, and 4.2 million syndromic surveillance messages a month. Uh, and that's just us, uh, with everybody else doing their thing. I haven't heard of any other or seen any other public-private partnerships across the country that are achieving the level of results that are, are being done here in Michigan along those lines. So congratulations, I know some of the directors over those areas are, are here today. Congratulations to all of you for the leadership uh, and innovation in, in pushing things that direction and, and setting a high bar for others to uh, emulate. Um, in addition, uh, we're very close with the, uh, the newborn registry working with Alpina and we've been doing work with um, the uh, immunization query use case, long awaited. Uh, and, and we're uh, making great progress along that line, having worked with Lakeland. So um, there is much to be proud of in Michigan uh, in this area. Um, uh, the state needs to be ready to accept it, but it also means that there is a lot of hard work done office by office, street by street, with lots of different vendors to get that data and get it ready to submit as well. So for all of you involved in that effort uh, across the state, uh, kudos to you as well. So that leads to a second aspect at looking at how we've done. Um, I believe the private sector in Michigan has made good progress in implementing health information technology and EMRs, as well as meaningful health information exchange um, at the local community level. Aside from those public sector use cases that I just referenced, practical solutions and capabilities to connect providers and communities across the state have been implemented and are improving the quality and efficiency of patient care. Uh, not a surprise to anybody in here, I'm sure, but uh, the federal meaningful use incentives have been a pretty big driver of those changes we've seen. Many millions of dollars have gone into uh, the provider community to help implement certified EMR systems. And if you, if you look back, if you um, have been around long enough to understand what CHINs and RIOs and some of those earlier iterations of health information exchange were, one of the big impediments was there just weren't enough nodes on the grid to make any sort of exchange meaningful. And uh, meaningful use, uh, while not perfect uh, and, and certainly difficult, uh, established a large number of nodes on the grid to uh, make health information exchange now much more viable. And uh, MCDA, uh, 
announced in February that they'd achieved their goal, uh, an original target of helping over 3,700 eligible professionals become meaningful use certified. So congratulations to Dan and that team. Uh, as we look back, that is hard work in the office to uh, get that many folks certified, so that's a job well done as well. From an HIE standpoint, we've seen plenty of change and even some consolidation over the past five years, and if I can take just two and a half minutes to give you a quick update on Great Lakes Health Connect, which came into being as a nonprofit 501c3 through the merger last July of what was known as Michigan Health Connect and Great Lakes Health Information Exchange. Um, I give it to you not as a sales pitch, but because I believe that GLHC is one of the significant success stories in Michigan and really across the country over the last five years, and a source uh, for Michigan pride. It occurred because the providers in Michigan, and many of you are in this room, put competitiveness aside and chose to coalesce around a common network for the patients that you serve. That's rare and should be celebrated loudly. So I won't go into all of these slides. Uh, you can get them from the conference and, and um, uh, at, your, at your leisure afterwards. Uh, but as Larry said, GLAC is one of the largest HIEs in the country. Uh, you see the coverage there of 82 percent of the acute care beds and thousands of uh, other connections across the state as well. We have half the state's population in our master person index uh, and are um, storing millions of clinical transactions every month from Detroit to Traverse City in the longitudinal health record. Um, GLHC as a small business is experiencing double-digit growth, which is fun by itself and is 100 percent financially sustainable without the need for taxpayer or other grant funding. So I'll speak to that HIE sustainability at a national level here in a second, um, but that fact alone is fairly rare, as you'll see not just in Michigan, but nationally too. So from an operational standpoint, uh, GLHC receives a little over 40 million messages a month and delivers uh, just uh, slightly more than that to downstream participants or other services, including MyHIN. Uh, that is a combined current run rate of one billion transactions a year that GLHC is processing. I uh, recently saw SureScripts process six and a half billion in 2014, American Express six, PayPal 4.2. We're not there, but we're starting to talk with a B after the name. It's, it's an elite company in the United States based on the volume of messages we're handling securely and in a financially viable way. So the next three slides give some uh, details that I won't get into, but you can review them later. In summary, what I wanted to really get across as part of this is that the merger of Great Lakes Health Connect has resulted in one of the premier health information exchange organizations in the country as measured by the geographic area covered, depth of solutions offered, and volume of real meaningful exchange that's happening in thousands of locations across the state every day, and it's happening here. M much of which for the community, independent community physicians, is provided at no cost. Um, I think it's one of the most underreported um, success stories in the state today. We still have a lot of work to do to realize our vision of making sure that a uh, person's data is available anywhere they show up for care, but we are uh, well on our way. We're ahead of the curve uh, nationally, and uh, unlike other states, I think without this level of private stakeholder investment and collaboration, uh, we don't need to recreate the wheel uh, or spend taxpayer dollars to build capability that already exists. It's something that we should be jointly leveraging together. So broadening the view nationally, many of the headlines and the key issues related to HE across the country remain pretty similar to last year's list. Financial sustainability uh, and interoperability. So the transition to grant funding, uh, click through a couple things here. To sustain HIE operations is occurring to some extent across the country, um, fine, but continues to be a challenge. Uh, the eHealth initiative, and you see the contents of their survey up here, they're a multi-stakeholder healthcare IT research education advocacy group down in DC, conducted its annual survey in 2014. And last year I talked about some of the findings from their 2013 survey. It's wide ranging, not just talking about um, the organizations that do HIE, but exchange more broadly. They reported um, in the uh, last year's report that of the 125 organizations that completed the survey, 45 said that the revenue they collect from dues and fees is enough to cover their business operations. Another 38 said they receive some funding through dues and fees but require other funding sources um, to cover their costs and stay in business. 
Uh, and then there are 33 that said the participants don't have to pay anything, uh, which suggests that the HIE is fully funded by grants or other sources of, of funding for their business operations. So after five years, if we continue to ask that question, we still only have 45 organizations across the country that report to being financially viable based solely on the HIE services that they deliver. Um, obviously, less than one per state with all the states out trying to do their thing. All others depend on some form of non-business related assistance to pay the bills. Um, so unless HIE becomes a governmental um, controlled and funded through governmental uh, agencies, we're going to continue to see an evolution in, in this particular area as, as the folks continue to struggle, as HIEs across the country continue to figure out how to do this in a financially viable way. Second topic is interoperability. We hear that word all the time, right? Um, a few months ago, the ONC released their federal interoperability roadmap which was generally well received, uh, I think. It's very aggressive from a timing standpoint, pretty broad ranging in the different things that it touched on. Um, some wanted to see oversight go a little farther uh, at the federal level, but they intentionally did not put a heavy hand from Washington DC on governance of health information exchange. They're still pushing pretty hard for the industry to regulate itself and to figure out how to get this wide scale interoperability done. The plan, uh, one of the key features in there that you'll hear more of as well, um, talked about API, Application Programming Interface Standards, uh, FHIR being one of those, and I won't even begin to try and explain that uh, right now, but you're going to hear more about it. It's supposed to, rather than the CCD that's big and is 45 and 100 pages and difficult to maybe use, FHIR is supposed to break that down into smaller Lego-ish type components um, and make it easier for exchange. So I think we're going to start seeing a lot more uh, talk and activity in that area to help. A uh, report was also recently released that you may have seen on information blocking. Uh, it was an interesting report for me um, because it absolutely concluded that information blocking occurs uh, and also readily admitted that you can't really recognize it and it is, would be difficult to kind of regulate. Um, kind of a, I know it's there but I can't necessarily show it to you sort of a thing. So. I told a reporter I was talking to last week from a national healthcare magazine that as I've traveled around uh, Michigan, uh, there is not a single provider, physician, anybody in the healthcare industry who has told me that they would block information in support of patient care for business reasons. Hinted at it, whether they told me, I haven't seen it. Um, in fact, Michigan should be known really for how competitive organizations have come together under the banner that we will do this because it's the right thing to do. Um, no business wants to give away its customer list and say that's reasonable. Um, so from that standpoint, nobody wants that out. But as it relates to patient level treatment, payment operation sorts of activities, universally in my travels, everybody has been all in around here. Is the blocking happening with the EMR vendors? Perhaps. Um, I'm not an EMR defender. I have my issues with them as well. Um, but the real world fact today for those of us that are in the trenches is this integration is not plug and play yet. There's real work that has to occur to get the data from one place to another and that has real cost associated with it. I think what's the bigger issue is what's the definition of reasonable cost to make these things uh, happen. So I think there's some things there, but interoperability is really about more than technology, um, and it's something that's never going to be done. As systems change, as process change, as standards change, we are never going to be in a world where all of a sudden we say interoperability is done. We are continually going to be challenged by it, and really for me it represents the uh, business case, the core value for exchanges in the middle to make sure that we can get that done regardless of whether the standards aren't perfect. So where are we going? Lastly, what should we be looking at over the next five years? Five plus years ago, the world looked very different than it does today. Um, I think we have to take an honest look at the environment we find ourselves in and adjust our plans or develop new ones to continue to take advantage of the opportunities that are in front of us. There's an old familiar phrase that we've all heard. If you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there, right? If we're on a trip together and we don't know where we're going or we don't 
uh, in the case of my wife, sometimes have a common understanding of where we're going. Um, if we don't know where we're going, any direction sounds good. Um, we're at the whim of whatever I fancy or idea uh, suits us. And for those that have recently retired, you jump in a motorhome, and maybe that's a good thing uh, that you can do. But we, anything sounds good or whatever is marketed. We get focused on the cool restaurants, hotels, rest areas, quality of the roads, where it isn't raining, whatever it is, um, which are all important and good things on a trip, but are distractions at best and catastrophic at worst if they lead us away from our ultimate destination uh, or dra drain our resources in, in directions we don't want to go. We collectively, I think, need to continue to stay focused on having a common clarity around what the ultimate destination is we're traveling to so we make sure that we stay focused on those things that are actually driving there. I firmly believe with everything in me that Michigan is on the forefront of, a of this national HIE effort when I look at what we're doing here and stands at the doorstep of realizing that vision of a consumer's data being where it needs to be to support their care and wellness. Today, we have the ability for a St. John's patient in Detroit to run their car. I have snowmobile here, but today they couldn't run their snowmobile, so I'll change it to car. To run their car into a tree in Traverse City and have the real-time clinical data available in the longitudinal health record for the months in EDs to use in treating them. That same longitudinal record will also have the clinical information from Munson in it when that patient returns home to seize their St. John's physician. The infrastructure exists today across the state to enable that workflow across other communities and, and regions. Over the next five years, I think our challenge is not going to be whether the capability is there. It's how do we use it? Okay, it exists. What are you going to do with it now? How do we change the way care is delivered? Things have to be different. We have to grow in that change to understand how we're going to use these things. And I think that we need to focus on using them across uh, a wide range of, of settings, including the um, uh, state programs, Medicaid or other programs where we have care managers or the health plans that support those populations um, that are managing the care of, of patients. If, if care managers need to understand that clinical history and rather than logging into all the <laughs> systems or trying to uh, find it on paper. They need this record. Um, it's been the holy grail for a lot of years uh, in the earliest days of the HIE program, and Michigan stands poised to realize it now uh, with its availability. So the business of medicine is becoming digitized. The practice of medicine is a very local personal activity between patients and their physicians. Meaningful exchange must be accomplished within this local community context based on specific workflows, physical, behavioral, social, all tied together as uh, Lieutenant Governor Kelly was talking about. Standards are important, but they're not the point. Interoperability is important, but it's not the core point either. Both are means to an end in doing whatever it takes to support those local care management and delivery workflows in each uh, unique corner of the state. We've made a lot of progress in Michigan over the past five years and laid the infrastructure that's going to take us into a pretty interesting five years to come. Different from the former plans we've had, we've got a whole diff new set of capabilities, uh, both public and private, uh, that we need to, uh, to leverage and point us in that direction so we can say no to the good stuff and stay focused on saying yes to the best stuff. Uh, in conclusion, I have a picture in my office of this uh, boardwalk that stretches out onto a white sand beach at sunset and you see all the cool orange and other colors um, that are out there and, and the letters across the bottom big letters uh, I've probably seen some of these before but it has the word vision laid out there in big letters and below it the phrase says a leader's job is to look into the future and see the organization not as it is but as it can become so I think the conference here gives us all the ability to step out of what is to try and take a look at what can become I see uh, deeply in me that Michigan's health information exchange, what it can become, and how we're tying things together and seeing it start to materialize before our eyes every single day through the public and private uh, innovation. The longitudinal health record across the state isn't a pipe dream anymore. It's not something out there that's, boy, I wonder what it would look like. We have it. Um, we just need to collectively decide to take advantage of it figure out how to use it to increase the quality of care, decrease the cost of care, 
and more effectively manage the health of the populations of those folks uh, that are our friends, families, and citizens that we serve around. It's going to take change from where we are. Let's determine not just to change, but also to grow. And I look forward to uh, working with all you guys to make that happen. Thanks very much. And I think Tim's next. Thank you. <clears throat> How many people watched the movie last night? You can, it's okay. okay. Um, I said at the end of that movie, don't be depressed. I think Doug has given you a very clear argument for why Michigan isn't depressed on this topic at all. Um, do I need to click through all my slides? Or Okay, yeah, okay, good. Um, we, uh, we've been wildly successful in this state. Great Lakes is one of the crown jewels in the nation for all this HIE stuff actually working. Um, we have like nine HIEs in, in Michigan. Um, we call these these uh, qualified HIEs. And they've all got their own sustainability models. They're all doing different kinds of things. And we, we are sort of nurturing this ecosystem. And for, for a lot of reasons, many of which are Doug's leadership and, and the way the community came together in Michigan, we're being successful. And this ecosystem is complicated. It's growing. The number of actors, I think there are just, you know, my hand's not even an HIE. My hand is a network of networks. Um, there's 50 different trusted entities in this ecosystem so far. And as we talk about adding social services, as we talk about getting at the root causes of the determinants of health, this ecosystem gets sort of bigger and bigger. But at the same time, we've got to keep the ground floor kind of moving. And um, essentially, we've got to do a lot more coordination, a lot more coordination, a lot more alignment ac across the state at a lot of different levels. <clears throat> this, <clears throat> this graph basically shows um, what we often do of you know, everybody doing their own thing. <clears throat> and there's a little formula there of n times n minus 1 divided by 2. And it shows you what happens when you don't have an architecture or a strategy for how you're going to advance things. <clears throat> and what we're, what we're really trying to achieve is ultra-scale or very, very large data sharing that's very predictable. And we're, we're talking about things like legal interoperability so that, that the contract people are all on board, the risk managers, the folks who are terrified of sharing information can share information and feel good about it. Um, because we don't want them holding the rest of the people who know they want to share information back. There's the technical integration, which has its own challenges, uh, but, but you know, technology is great. Uh, they keep inventing new, new ways to do things. So in many ways, the technology is not what's holding us back. There, there are tough things there, but it's not the sticky wicket. We need to have authoritative sources of truth, places where we know, yes, that is an authoritative, I, I took that piece of information, I made a decision, we took action, and everybody in the system should say, well, that, that's the standard practice, that's the best anyone could do, and that's acceptable based on, uh, based on the decision that they made. Lots of opportunities for reuse. Lots of opportunity for taking duplicate efforts and um, eliminating them. And the way that's done is by when somebody does something one time, not asking them to do it kind of slightly different over here to the side. Uh, slices or, or cuts by, uh, uh, death by a thousand cuts. And then program integrity. We actually do need to know who all the people are. If we give somebody an account, we have to do good identity management so we have high reliability that the people accessing these systems is really who we think it is. And when we match patients, we have to be pretty clear that we're all talking about the same patient or bad things can happen. Um, this chain of trust is a big deal. It's, it's gonna be a much bigger deal as time goes on, okay? Um, we in healthcare are finally getting to, to sort of understand sharing information. It's not clear the patients fully understand or have expressed their opinions on this yet. Um, and the reason that legal chain of trust needs to be uh, maintained and taken care of is because when you do that little formula and you multiply out, whether you're talking about interfaces or opportunities to spend quality time with your lawyer, um, 
this becomes a really big deal. And it's not the cost of paying the lawyers. It's the time that it takes to go through all of these processes. We want to get things done in a hurry, which means we need to completely prepackage and modularize everything that we're doing so you can advance connecting and sharing information. Now, one of those trusted sources of information in the environment is what we call the active care relationship service. And this is sort of the, the, the big patient roster of who's connected to whom that begins to sort of simplify the map of what does the extended care team look like. In the simplest sense, it has this doctor and this patient go together. And we have to take this information and expose it to as many people who have a, a, a legitimate need to access it so they know who to, who to contact. And uh, since December, we've, we've really started getting these active care relationships and we're getting them from all over the state. There's, there's over five million of them now, but I anticipate this will grow considerably. Um, but, but really, who goes with whom is important. And then, really, as we get the providers, and we have the same kind of distribution of, of providers from all over attached to these patients who need to find out when certain important things happen so they can be notified about the care uh, or what to do with their patients. Um, it's a great study by Dr. Uh, Overhaig, uh, uh, famous out of uh, Indiana, that says uh, healthcare is not local. Actually, a lot of healthcare is local, but unfortunately, a lot of our expensive patients kind of move all over, and you don't know where they're, they're going to go, and it's those rare conditions that are going to increasingly fall through the cracks. Um, this active care relationship infrastructure has got to begin to expand. Doug mentioned care coordinators got to begin to get the care coordinators connected in with who are the doctors, who are the patients, how do all these pieces fit? So we're, we're poised to do this who's going to coordinate the care coordinators kind of function. And we need to begin to sort of expand that to well, what hospitals have relationships, what long-term care facilities, what pharmacies, and, and make sure we can be very, very clear to people who we're releasing information to what is an active care relationship and how are you connected to, to, to my data or to me and, and can I revoke that, that uh, relationship status? Another major example of an opportunity for alignment is around all of this performance monitoring, quality measure kinds of things. Usually when we show this graphic to physicians, they, they start seething. We, we say, well, look, there's all these measures. And then there's all the measures that are in the electronic health record. And then there's other measures like HEDIS that health plans are, over, are, are measured on. And then the Venn diagram in the very middle you go, well, there's only 14 measures that intersect. And if we, we look at all the evaluation programs, there's only five. That's a problem not of technology. That's a problem of coordination and alignment. And that's an opportunity for us to reduce burdens we can under the hood to do electronic clinical quality measures and figure out better ways to transport that data, but we got to start right up at the top to say, how do we get alignment among all the actors so we're not all asking for different things? The good news is in Michigan, we're coming up um, on a period of abundance. In the past, most people have had scarcity. Data has been very precious. It's been hard to get. People have learned how to operate in its absence. Um, we put all the energy into getting the data, and our mindset is, is very much how do we get the data. Not a lot of thought on how do we edit the data or curate the data, because it's not a big deal, because you haven't had as much, especially from the outside world. Um, often you have developed a workflow for getting things done without that information. And in that, in that world, um, you're just excited to get the data. But anybody who's watched what's happened with EHRs, as soon as the data shows up, the story changes. I can't find anything, okay? Because now they have too much information. And that problem of abundance is where we're headed now, where we have to get our heads around and put our energy into what do you really want? What do you really need? Is it, is it important to show all this to the doctor? Or can we, can we zoom right in and focus our energy onto exactly what's going to give them the most effective use versus creating kind of an information overload? And then we have to put a huge amount of energy into quality and curating the data, the, the data that's going to be most actionable 
and um, most able to help us. And so we have a process under this Myhin infrastructure governance. We call it the use case factory to begin to help people to package up and prioritize how are we going to focus on what kinds of things need to be shared at the broadest level. And the, the whole concept is that everybody has a great idea on what should be shared. Not everybody wants to reach into their wallet and pay for how to do that sharing. And so the ideas surface. We then take those ideas and package them to figure out, well, how do we deliver and implement them and typically somebody has to sponsor that activity. But just because you can technically do something does not mean it's a priority to do. So the very next step is to say, okay, are people incentivized appropriately or disincentivized to actually take and adopt and implement that next thing? And despite how you feel about meaningful use, it, it followed aspects of this and it, it helped to drive adoption. Um, each of these use cases has components. What it is, what its value proposition is, a legal document that outlines the rules of engagement to make it very clear what's gonna happen. This is very important for anti-competitive kinds of concerns or business development kinds of concerns. And then an implementation guide that takes the ambiguity out of how to implement the standards and when and if, uh, what the conditions are for when you actually send something. Uh, but the, the sort of secret ingredient to the alignment is that for each use case, we have to surround it with um, motivators. We've learned a valuable lesson over the last few years, and that is people tend to do what they're paid to do or they're punished if they don't do. And that creates an opportunity for them to often um, do what I think somebody described really well is um, if you poke people in their wallets, their hearts tend to follow. Because um, most people tend to want to do the right thing, but the agendas, the incentives don't line up to make that easy for them. And we've had good success proving that this works with the statewide ADT infrastructure, where we've been able to really get um, um, 80 or 93 percent of all the ADTs in the state sent to a common place, been able to get sort of the active care relationship structure set up to take and reroute that information and bounce that off of where are all the people liking to receive their information, whether that's by direct or one of the uh, HIEs they're connected to. But what's really important there is it's very hard for the HIEs to go to the people who are paying them and say, we want you to change your business practice. So you kind of have to reach outside just the provider space and get a multi-provider kind of dialogue going around this alignment that says, hey, in order to improve the quality of the data, you're going to have to change your business practice. So that means somebody else who either pays or regulates care is going to have to sort of provide the incentives to the given use case to motivate everybody to prioritize with a sense of urgency, hey, you need to adopt this use case. And that, that back and forth takes us out of the technical connectivity into the how are we going to really begin to solve problems and have a dialogue around which kinds of data sharing need to jump to the surface, and then how do you begin to do the quality control to make sure that the data that's being shared in a very broad way is consistent and more easily consumable by this brand new group of people who, who need to receive it. The reuse comes in by taking that same process, that same pattern, the same kinds of legal structures, and now plugging in different kinds of use cases, whether it's a discharge medication reconciliation following the same process, whether it's sharing care plans, whether it's death notices. There's a lot of different things for just in this whole category of notifications where you get a lot of reuse. So what this process does is it's really trying to elevate the conversation um, from data standards really down at the bottom to what are the stories, what are the ways that these packages and pieces need to come together so that we, we get away from talking about just uh, those evil vendors aren't helping us to what's the business practice we really need to make sure we enable. Now, many of you heard yesterday about precision medicine, we heard about analytics, we hear all the time about population health management. The way these use cases plug in to the learning process, and Dr. Friedman will speak today more about the learning health system, 
Uh, but basically, these use cases enable the sort of broader dialogue to occur, and that that care process actually generates data that goes into population health, it goes into sort of precision medicine and, and, and analytics type situations. It generates brand new information that actually can get fed back into the system in a formal way in the context of an entirely new use case that makes it consumable and understandable and defendable to, to folks as well. Um, there's a lot of building blocks that are continuing to uh, unfold. Michigan is, uh, yes, doing really well, but we have an awful lot of work ahead of us to continue to connect all the dots and make it more scalable to brand new audiences. Um, and increasingly, uh, this environment is, is set up so that what we do with the state of Michigan, more and more organizations are going to want to do by this single point of entry where the cybersecurity people, are, their, their concerns are real, and that we're really trying to make sure more and more we reduce the size of the attack surface for folks so there's very clear in and out entry points for organizations so they know exactly where and how their data is, is flowing. With that, I'll turn it over to Cynthia. So I would guess that most of the people here are not here just because it's their job, that they're here because they have a personal experience that drives them and gives them the passion to want to make this work. And I have to tell you that, you know, I, I have a number of stories myself, and one of them was a situation with my mother. I got a call that she was in the emergency department, and... Um, you know, things were not going very well, so I rushed down there. When I got there, I was told that she's incoherent. We can't understand what she's trying to tell us. We, we don't think that she's really, um, you know, very uh, cohesive, comprehensive in her speech and so forth. So they thought that there were issues that were going on. Maybe she had some mental health issues. She was... Um, in her older um, stage of life. And then I was told that she needed to talk to me. So I went into the room, and my mother starts trying to ask me something, and I can't understand what she's saying. I said, you don't understand. She doesn't have her dentures in. You can't understand what she's saying. She really has quite an active mind. Um, her memory is much better than mine. You know, we just can't understand her because she doesn't have her dentures in. She never goes without her dentures. So we didn't have the dentures, so we couldn't, you know, utilize them. So we're trying to figure out what she's trying to say. She asked me a question, and as soon as I responded to that question after I could understand it, she immediately became unresponsive. Now, you know what that question was? Is Medicaid going to pay for this? You know, that, that's really heartbreaking because those are things that we take for granted. We take for granted that we have our teeth and we can speak and people understand us and that we don't have to worry. We have insurance. It's going to pay for it. Well, it took me an hour and a half to get there. So you can understand she was very agitated for that whole period of time because nobody understood her and she was so concerned because if Medicaid wasn't going to pay for it, She's getting out of there because she can't afford it. Those are the things that we really need to look at, that whole person. We need to really take a look and step back. You know, we look at all this aggregate data. Um, transportation came up. That's been issues many times. The um, high utilizers of the emergency department, we always start looking at why are they high utilizers? We gotta make some changes there. Well, where we, what we found after doing this many times, many years, we've been looking at that, and in Grand Rapids, is that you start looking at the facilities. That was brought up um, with the lieutenant governor as well. When you look at the transportation and those individuals that are going to the emergency departments, do they have the transportation to get there? Well, if they have to take the bus, what are the routes? And when you, they took the bus and they looked at that population, there were urgent cares that were not available. So they went to the emergency department first because you had to pass up the emergency departments before you got to the urgent care. 
So if that, emergent, that urgent care was there first, they may have gone to that. So we have to step back and take a look at the whole person, what are those needs, and then try to address that. As um, Director Lyons said yesterday, you have to have the technology, it has to be meaningful. And even though in the first situation with my mother, she came from home to the emergency department, didn't have all the information, the second time it was from a skilled nursing home. And they still didn't have all the information that they needed in order to be able to care for her. So it doesn't matter what the situation is, you have to have the information, and it has to be in a form that you can consume. And the comment that uh, Tim made about having the abundance of the data, that you know we've had that situation happen where I said, okay, we need the data, we need the data, we give you the data, oh, I don't have a system to utilize that data, or I don't know what it means. I don't know what that really tells me because we need to have that whole picture of an individual and because of that, we have siloed in our knowledge of information that we don't know what all of it means. So that's another area where we have to coordinate care, we have to talk to those other caregivers and you know the, the different types of caregivers in order to be able to understand that. So we have a lot of initiatives that are going on that really are forcing that issue of having to coordinate that care, having a lot of different entities that are participating in that. And what it really does, it drives down to the actual local level. You know, you have to start there. We have, you see all this great technology that we have at the state, we have at MyHen, we have at all the QOs like Great Lakes Health Connect, but unless you have all those individuals that are connected and are sharing, it doesn't matter. So we really rely on the HIE QOs to make sure that they're making those connections, to go out and talk to all those providers and get them connected so that we can have the information that we need in order for us to be able to meet these goals that we have. And even though I represent Medicaid, what we're doing is not just for Medicaid. What we're doing is for the state of Michigan. And so we're really concerned about that, and what we're trying to do is to be able to leverage some of the technologies that we have, to be able to share some of the information we have that may not be available elsewhere. That's what we need to do. When we're working on the uh, My Health Link, the dual eligible integrated care, we started off you know, having a difficult time, but we had all of our stakeholders together and saying, what is it that you need to coordinate care? And that was very difficult, you know, and a lot of times they still stayed siloed. And as we keep asking, and what else, how are you gonna use this information? We weren't hearing that they were gonna talk to the other plan in order to be able to coordinate that care. And then also, what is the data that we need for that? You know, what, what do you need? What do your care coordinators need and care support coordinators need in order to be able to manage that care? At first it started off with all the information then it was, well, maybe we don't need all of it, maybe we need a little. We have assessments all over the place. Assessments are different formats all over. We don't have standard um, formats for assessments, but that's okay. We can take the assessment and we can translate that into a standard to at least send the data somewhere else and then they know what that means. So as we're trying to develop these um, continuity of care documents in order to be able to share data with the integrated care organization, the prepaid inpatient health plan, and then them back and forth, uh, integrated care organization to the other integrated care organization, we wanna make sure that we have some standardization. Now, there isn't a standard out there that has all the behavioral health and the physical health, all the assessment information, all those other support services in that document. So we have to create something. Well, it doesn't really mean that we're customizing it. Just as what we're doing with birth defects and others, we're trying to create that standard. And I can tell you that once we get this up and running, and even if it's not complete and it's not going to be complete right now, and we're gonna be changing this as we go along, it's a place to start. And then we can move forward and we can modify it and we can enhance it and we can improve it as we're going forward and we're actually utilizing it and know what is needed in order to be able to do that. So we have a lot of initiatives that right now that we are using policy levers in order to be able to move some of those forward. It is unfortunate that sometimes, you know, those are the things that we have to use in order to do that, even if everybody thinks it's the right thing to do. So and when we um, have included the health information exchange within our bids for our managed care plans, 
that's going to help us move forward as well. And I'm sorry for the plans. You don't have to do that. But for those of you that have gone through this with the encounter data with me, you know that it was the right thing to do. And we are benefiting from that as we go forward. With the electronic health records, when we were trying to get our appropriation for our funding, the state budget office asked us for a 10-year plan. And I have to shout out to um, Jeff Shaw. We looked at each other and go, really? We don't even know what we're doing yet. And we're going to have to come up with a 10-year plan. We don't even know what it all means. We know what some of it means. And I, and I have to say that, you know, we didn't have all the answers. We had the ideas. We had the vision. You know, as Doug mentioned, we didn't know what all the details were going to be as we went along. We got a lot of it right because we had that vision of what we, where we needed to go. And part of that was what is our um, MDHHS data hub. And, you know, with all of these different diagrams that we have, we can't even keep up with them because, you know, the, the technology changes in each of the different places. And, you know, so Tim and I are having a hard time keeping up with some of this. But as you can see, you know, within the state, we have to do all those same things that they have to do at the QOs, that they have to do at my end to be able to, to link up information, to know it's the right person, to make sure it's only going to the right place. A lot of the times, you know, I'm the security officer for the health side, and, you know, people think I'm going to say, no, we can't share. We can share, we just need to make sure we're sharing it with the right people. And that's where a lot of these initiatives are that are coming up. We have our master person index, we have a provider index, and that's being leveraged with my hands so that we're, we can link people up. We do not share the actual index and the code that we have because that'd be like handing out your social security number. And that's what we keep, you know, um, very secure. It will give you back your own identifier, and that's how we know across the board that it's the same individual by those identifiers, but we don't share the identifier that we create through those master person index and the provider index. And then we have our MyCAM, which is our information credential and access management, and my login, in order to be able to make sure that it is secure, that we know that you are the person you say you are when you come in, and that you have access to only the information that you should have access. So we, we're building our own hub and all this infrastructure that we need to have within the state in order for all of this to work so that we can go out and grab information from the electronic health record for the maternal infant health program. After they go through their risk assessment, we can also send it back to that electronic health record. Well, that's all, all going to be dependent on that active care registry, the health provider directory, our indexing that we have both master person index and provider index. So we all have to work together. None of this can we do alone. It may look like we're duplicating some of these things, but we have to do some of this within our own organization so that we can get ourselves all together so we know all this information within our own organization as we're sharing it across organizations. And we all have to work together. And we can't you know, do any of this by ourselves. So on the right-hand side of this slide has all those initiatives that were on one of the other pages. It doesn't matter what those initiatives are. We didn't even know what some of those were when we had to come up with that 10-year plan. But what we have to develop is something that no matter what that initiative is, we've got the technology that we can utilize in order to be successful. And we're not asking all of you to do something that we're not asking ourselves to do. And within state government, we have an executive directive that the governor said, we need to be able to share data as well. And the lieutenant governor mentioned about one of the initiatives, the no wrong door. We can't do that even within the state unless we're all working together, we come up with standards, we're sharing data, we know who the person is across all of our systems, and we have a lot of systems, as you could imagine, and a lot of different departments where those systems are. That, that's a major challenge. We've had some initiatives that we tried to work on the, the veterans, and we had issues with roadblocks, you can't share data, can't share data with certain people, and so forth. So we weren't able to really move forward, although we haven't forgotten, we wanted to start that initiative back up, and is that we have a lot of data that we want 
in order to be able to use to help support these initiatives. Foster care is another one. You know, crosses over many departments. There's not just one department that manages foster care. And we've been working on this in silos with the different departments. So there's four or five departments that have been going out and trying to manage that same population by taking those same services that we're building for the Health Information Exchange and using information from the Health Information Exchange along with the data that we have within our different departments, we're able to better see that larger picture of the individual. And that's what it's all about again. If you talk about you know, that 10-year plan that I mentioned, we, we got a lot of it right. And what we got right is what we're able to do right now is to be able to share and leverage across. But again, we can't do any of this unless all of us are working together because even with health information exchange, we've got our stakeholders. And you can see with these other departments, they have their own stakeholders. And a lot of those that are involved in managing and trying to help out the individuals, you know, we're talking about the unemployment and trying to get them employed, they have a lot of people that are helping them in those local communities as well. So it's not just connecting again at the state we need to connect out to those local areas. And I just have to say, the um, Major General Granger, in the picture that he showed of the neonatal ICU, I, I used to be a nurse, I still pay for my license, and I worked in intensive care and that looked just like one of the rooms that I walked into one day. And as I was, we changed shifts and I was going in to do my assessment on the individual, I walked in there and I just like, Oh my gosh, I, I can't even see the patient, okay? And I've got the calls from the doctors and they want to know all these numbers. Well, not all the systems worked. You had different systems, technology for every little piece of, of the information. I had to do some calculations and I kept saying, I can't even get to the patient. You know, and when we get back to, you know, looking at the needs of the patient, looking at the whole patient is that, I couldn't even in that situation be able to do that, and so I, I just said, you have to give me a minute to get to the, to the patient so that I can assess that patient, because it didn't matter what the numbers were going to be, it all depended on what I was going to see when I saw that patient. And that, that's something that's just really important now, and people have asked me, well, how would you like to be a nurse today with all this technology? I would love to be a nurse today with all that technology. You don't have the rooms that are like that today. You have less that you need. You have more information you need. You don't have to do the calculations yourself. And so we have all this available to us, but we need to be able to share that information. And I, I'm just really grateful that all of you are here and we do have the support that we do from our governor, our lieutenant governor, as you've heard, and then from all of you that are really working so hard to make this successful. Thank you. We have time for some questions, so um, we'll open it up. I hope there, raise your hand if you would like a, a mic. Hi, Tom Simmer from Blue Cross. I'm interested in directing a question to, to Cynthia Green Edwards. Um, first of all, I, we're working very hard to get safety net and menti, mental health organizations connected through Acres Files and the rest to the statewide information service, particularly for admission, discharge, and transfer information. And in the recent Medicaid rebid, I think there was a very positive step taken by the state to assure that practitioners in these areas are well connected to try to address some of the things that the Lieutenant Governor mentioned in terms of the la lack of connectedness between the physical health and mental health providers. I'm wondering if you could comment more on um, what the state is attempting to accomplish through that rebid language and what you would like to see happen from those of us who can sort of make things happen um, relative to that. Thank you. Well, I think you're... Okay. We're, we've had a lot of initiatives that have gone on, you know, prior that we said the health plans, we want you to coordinate care, um, whether it's, you know, it's the behavioral health and the physical health coordinating care. and you know, they thought that there were a lot of barriers doing that. So we said, we can alleviate some of those barriers by saying, you utilize these standards, we have the infrastructure, we're building the infrastructure in order to be able to make it happen. When we hear our mental health folks say, 
we need to know right away that somebody has gone into the emergency department and has been um, discharged or they've been in the hospital and been discharged. They can't do anything with that individual and really take some action unless they have that information. With those initiatives that we talked about, the ones that I've been involved in, that's the very first thing that we keep hearing. We need the ADT messages. If you can just tell us that something happened, we'll go and find all the rest of the information. We'd like to have it all, but at least if we had some idea that something happened, and then we can take action, and we can do the interventions that we need to do on a timely basis in order to really impact care and, and the positive outcomes. And that really is what it's all about. And you know, we hear all the time, we have to have the information. You do have to have the information. You have to have the data, and you have to have complete data, and you have to have quality of data. So if we're all working together on this, then I think we can achieve it much sooner. And you know, having the state be a part of that with all of our other stakeholders, we think we'll get there a lot sooner. Does that answer your question? We know you're out there. So the lights <laughs> prevent us from seeing anything. Hi, good morning. Uh, really enjoyed the presentation. And as somebody who uh, comes from away, um, I just have to tell everyone that, as Tim said at the end of the evening yesterday, you all really are an example for the rest of the nation. Um, I have the pleasure of getting to travel to lots of states, and, um, and it's exciting. But I do have a question, though, for you. I, I think the, the vision. Um, uh, Tim and Cynthia that you have with your, your illustrations is so great. So I'm thinking that a little later today, Dr. Friedman's going to talk about the learning health uh, system. So uh, how would you envision, what's the sort of third set of pictures, and Tim, you had a little bit of it um, in your slide, but I'm thinking sort of more specifically, actionably, with research activities that might be happening here in Michigan, sort of how, how is how are those cycles going to, um, in an active way, kind of also uh, build into the learning health system that, that you have with the HIEs and the state operations? Is this on? <clears throat> so, um, you know, everything in our world is a use case. And so I, I, there's a lot of opportunity. The problem is there's so much opportunity that we have to create a mechanism for people to prioritize. And so I see the research community discovering, hey, there's this flow of information happening. Um, what's the right way to tap into it? And left to their own devices, they would build that ball of yarn and just get it however they, they could. But if we can offer up an appropriate structure to package use cases that are very explainable for research, then as our consent infrastructure ad advances on a statewide basis, people can basically consent to share their data into those, those new use cases that are more research oriented or more clinical trials oriented or more consumer oriented. Um, again, I, th I think we have some basic blocking and tackling still to do on a, on a broad level, but I, I think there's um, not too far out on the horizon an opportunity for the for the research community to start sort of lining up around what, what use cases are happening, how things are flowing, and then how would they appropriately tap into that, to that stream. And then what's the benefit for everybody else for them to take that new insight and feed it back into the system? And how does that, that new insight get con consumed back into the system? But that, that's sort of the vision that, that I'm seeing. I think there will also be, um, large pockets of folks who have enough data now on their own, just in their EMRs, to do very creative and insightful kinds of things. So I, I think those will both go on in parallel. And there are requests for data aggregators, but we have to figure out what that actually means and how they can use the data once they have the access to that data. So there's a lot of work that we have still to go on. You know, we've got 
the, this infrastructure established, and we can share data, but we, again, need to make sure that we're giving it to the right people and they're doing the right thing with the data and, and what they're allowed to do with that data. This uh, question is for Doug. Uh, Peter Schoenfeld with the Michigan Health and Hospital Association. My question is, uh, a vision towards the patient care, but what do you see as you connect the physicians and the hospitals and the other elements and operationalize it? How do they get it into their workflow? And there's a lot of differences across the state. So how do you see that stage of development and pace of making the patient care process integrated with the physician office and other caregivers? Yeah, I th well, I, it's, it's just, doggone hard work. Um, every, you, you put 10 cardiologists next to each other and say, how do you process information? How do you want to receive the information? What's relevant to you and the way you think? And they're all going to be uh, different. So I think what we found is, is we have to go street by street, office by office, and figure out what it means for every place. Uh, I mentioned that the business of medicine is changing. How it's financed is changing. Healthcare delivery and what we're expecting providers to do is changing, and everybody's swimming in that soup of really not knowing what the new world is ultimately going to look like. Um, the the requirements, the incentives, the policy levers, the you know whatever is is coming down are forcing a whole bunch of change, and I think in part understanding that there's going to be a, a big swirl of we don't know what we're doing until we get to the end of it, and we do, but it's very hard. <coughs> I think from a technology standpoint, <coughs> excuse me, there's no, in my uh, background, there's no project I would walk into that if I had some technology and they said, we really don't know what the business is, but install the technology and everything's going to be great, you know, we'll, we'll trust that the, that will fix it. Well, I know we've automatically lost. Um, you have to have well-defined business, then you can provide technology that actually supports that business. We're in a, we're in a place right now where the business is changing dramatically and we're throwing a lot of technology at it. And I think from our standpoint, we're just trying to engage it um, at a very uh, practical local level and say, uh, for those that are ready, how do we need to make this work for you, um, which may be different than the folks next door, and expect that uh, through a number of years of hard work, we'll eventually get there, but it, it's not gonna be a, probably an easy process for any of us. I think part of it too is that they don't all understand what the functionality is of what they have. You know, when an EHR vendor comes in and they explain all that, you know, you can only take in so much. And then as you try to implement, it takes a lot in order to implement, get your workflow down, that a lot of times you forget that there's other functionality that's available for you to use that is a part of the system that you already have. And so we need to keep you know, making sure that we're informing them that they do have capabilities that they're not even aware of. And, and with our EHR incentive program, we ask them questions like, do you have this functionality with your EHR and are you utilizing it? And the reasons why we ask that, it's all the functionality they should have, is that we're hoping that that's going to get them to start thinking about, oh, can you do that with your EHR? And then as we get the results and we say, okay, we think there's some educating that we can do because they are not even aware that their EHR should have these capabilities. And I think once they start doing that, you start utilizing the information, you've got more, then you can go on to that next step and then start asking those other questions of how else can we utilize this and what other information do I need in order to really manage the care. I just add one thing too. I think this is where <clears throat> I mentioned financial sustainability being an issue. I think that takes a lot of time to engage and, and help folks do that. And so I think as we look at the broad provider community, many of which are struggling to keep up with the payments to their EMR vendors and the things that they have to pay for that way, HIE is something that's a, a secondary thing. So I, I think the challenge is really trying to figure out how do we uh, with the current incentive structures and the current support structures that are being offered uh, for those that are on the ground, how do we provide that level of in-depth service to help folks get there when um, the, the funding of it typically isn't coming from those, those providers and, and even you know, more broadly than that is a little bit challenged as to where it's coming from. So that, that's part of why I think you only see 45 
across the country of us that have figured out some model to try and make it work, you know, up to this point. There, we'll take one more question, if, if there is one. Okay, great. Good afternoon, Hugh Gillinson from Data Motion, Health Information Service Provider. Uh, so on the direct secure messaging side, which many HIEs have adopted, uh, there are two parts to the success of the service, one being the direct transport, the other one being this uh, structured document called Content of Care Document, or CCDA. Um, many EHRs are equipped, at least conceptually, to handle the CCDA. Few actually seem to be parsing data, populating data to records the way that they're supposed to. So I'm wondering uh, you know, if this group is in a position to comment on you know, where we're at with the CCDA, are we really far enough along to uh, make this interoperability piece meaningful uh, for providers uh, in, the, in the scope of meaningful use? Thank you. Doug, you want to comment? I'll, I'll take it first. I, th I think, yeah, most uh, EMR vendors to comply could send one. <clears throat> most didn't really figure out how to receive one very well, so we've actually deployed inboxes for a lot of offices that have an EMR because the, the CCD could be sent, but there's no mechanism to actually receive it in a meaningful way, kind of from an uh, exchange standpoint. The vendors are working, I think, hard at trying to figure out how to um, de-blob those CCDs and deconstruct them. Uh, I think that's where fire is going to come in. What I don't know is whether the CCD ultimately becomes the best transport for that or whether f something else like fire says, hey, here's an easier way rather than trying to figure out how to deconstruct this thing. Here's a more discreet way to go after the data you want, and we may, be, may see some of that going on. Um, but uh, th there is a lot of at least CCDs being shared. And to Tim's point earlier about kind of the river and the information, now folks have it, and they're trying to figure out what, you know, what do I do with it? You know, now that I have it, what is really truly valuable here? And, and that, of course, that answer is different depending with each person that receives it. Yeah, and I, I, I agree. I think, I think we got these big unwieldy documents, and we probably need to go now in and edit the different chapters, and then you know, basically maybe th think of it as a textbook or a reference manual. You don't really need to sit down and read the whole book all the time. So are there sections that you need for certain situations, which, which we call use cases, and can you get everybody around a given use case, like you know, the one coming up is discharge med reconciliation. It still uses a CCD under the hood, but it tells everybody this part related to meds coming in and this part related to meds going out is gonna be filled out correctly, and you all need to know how to receive that part of it and do something with it. And you know, you're, so you're chunking those chapters, chapter at a time. But I, I agree with Doug, I think fire, um, and I'll put a plug in for the fire workshop on Friday, um, F-H-I-R, not, not fire, fire, um, is probably an opportunity for us to continue to expand. 